Welcome to Cane Roots Art Gallery, Callaloo Network Culture TV, broadcasting on Tempo Network, presenting Art Over Bush Tea. Today I'm happy to introduce an artist, not only just an artist, a friend, Carl Carney Bay, warmly and lovingly known as Bai. Bai is also the current artist on exhibit at the Cane Roots Art Gallery. The exhibit is called Portraits and Abstract. Welcome by, welcome to our gallery, welcome to our studio today. How Good are you? Great, thank you for having me. Oh, you're very, very welcome. I'm, I'm very, very excited because more importantly, um, I have followed your work for eight years and I've been collecting your work for eight years. So having you be a solo exhibit at the gallery right now and having you as the fourth segment on Art Over Bush Tea is extremely special. Before we get any further, I always like to introduce everyone to what we're drinking for tea. And today's tea has been made out of um, lemongrass grown on the island, tarragon, bay leaf, soursop leaf, and basil. So again, if you want me to repeat those ingredients, it's lemongrass, tarragon, bay leaf, soursop leaf, and basil. So that's really a lovely combination from very soothing and very peaceful and calm emotions to have. And that's what I'm having. So not only am I excited, there's also a calmness with me today. But what tea are you drinking today? Well, I'm not as elaborate as you are. I just have <laughs> Lipton. Lipton tea with two sugars and lemon. <laughs> Wonderful. That's good. That's a good, strong tea, Lipton. <laughs> All right. So welcome to the studio. Um, by, I wanted to start off by asking you, what was your early training like as an artist, if you would share that with us? Well, in childhood, my early training was comic books, like most artists. They usually uh, they start off with comic books and coloring books. We, with me, it was co um, uh, comic books with the uh, Superman stuff like that, which helped me with anatomy and, uh, anatomy and the shapes of the body and the face. Uh, in college, I just found at CCAC, which is California College of Arts and Crafts, which is now CCA uh, in Oakland, California. Uh, my background was in classical drawing, and then um, it kind of evolved. Uh, once I got out of college, I did a lot of uh, expressionistic work. Expressionist? Yes. You said? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so from that question, let's let's move into asking you. Let me ask you: Is there a um, specific um, tradition or technique to your work? Well, tradition it would be sim would be realism, which evolved into semi-realism, which in evolved into expressionism. As far as techniques are concerned, it's not something I'm willing to share. But what I can tell you is that I work on multiple pieces at one time. And what this does, it stops the pieces from becoming like looking alike. So it stops, it stops the pieces from being stacked. So you'll see something. You might see the same image, like a portrait, but it'd be totally different than any other portrait. Oh, OK. So on any particular given day, you're working on at least three pieces at one time and you stop and you go to the other. It's usually hmm. five to 10. That's the number I've always liked. How many? Five to 10. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That, that is amazing. So you would say that um, in terms of the way that you create your portraits. So right now we have the portraits in the gallery. Those portraits that you've created, which our viewing and listening audience will see later on in the show, you would say that those are realism? The portraits, uh, what, would, what, would you, what would you consider those drawings? 
expressionistic portrait. Express expressionistic uh, portraits. Right. Okay. So then as I, I'm looking at it or someone comes into the gallery, um, the expressionistic comes from you, the artist. Yes. And then me, the viewer, as I look at it, then I am then either relating in a way to it in terms of what I see in terms of that expression. Yes. Uh, you Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, that's how I've kind of always, um, you know, as I'm looking at camera, but I'm also viewing what's on the walls around me. There are many different ways that you have expressed those particular portraits that we will see later. What well, is there any difference between your early works and your present works? Uh, no, they're basically the same. Uh, the foundation for my work is realism uh, and making doing anatomical st structures of the face as well as the body. And of course, I do abstract pieces as well, but. Uh, for the portraits, the foundation has been that way for, I would say, since 1984. Mm -hmm. uh, so nothing much has changed. Uh, because with a portrait, uh, so let me back up and say this. The foundation for all of my portraits, you know, for a lot of my nudes as well, is the African sculpture. And so the... the I'm basically basically using the basic foundation and changing that foundation because you will never get tired of, of a linear structure, um, whether it's in a, a painting or or a sculpture itself. There's something about those linear lines that really draws you to it, and it makes a piece look so moving. Uh, that's the best way I can describe that. Oh, okay, by I think another in another segment, some another artist had brought up the linear line. So for again, for anyone who had missed that segment, the linear line is what we're talking about that is going across. Would that be vertical or horizontal? That's horizontal, but if you okay. go yeah, but if you go up, it's, it's, you can go horizontal and have a linear line, but you can also go vertical and have a linear line. So it's linear, meaning the curve and the, the movement of that line is the way I describe it, or the okay. way I've seen other well-known artists do it. When you, um, when you talked about the, the realism in your work, were you... Um, influenced by a particular person or a, a tradition of any kind with the realism in your work? Well, yes, the realism in my work comes from the Renaissance area, um, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Titan, Caravaggio. So your um, well-celebrated Renaissance artists. Um, so that's where that came, comes from. Uh, and then, of course, uh, contemporary modern would be Odd Nudrum. Um, I love his work. And it's basically a neo classism, neo uh, realism, I think would be the best way to describe his work. Some people have described his work. So, as a realist, being trained in realism most of my life, or my early life. I've always stuck to that and just added on as need. So. Realism, okay, all right. So we've moved through that your, in your career, being influenced by the Renaissance, the Renaissance period, and then we move from being in the Renaissance period to a modern period. Am I correct? Yes. Um, have you blended 
both of those influences in your in your creative work? Oh yes, uh, my nudes, like the one behind me. Uh, so that that's part of that realism evolving into something else, uh, or semi-realism, or abstract, or cubism. So the answer to that question is yes. Um, okay, so um, by would when you, when you say that would that be like um, and the audience can't see, but you and I are more familiar with the three graces. Yes, it's, it's a, a series of three women, three nudes, and um, it's it's a loving piece that I refer to as the three graces, and it's named the three graces, um, and it's part of a private collection. So that would be an example then. So because I'm not seeing the piece behind you right now. So I wanted to make sure for me, seeing your work over the past eight years, that I can make a relationship to it um, in terms of what you're talking, talking about the two pieces being merged. Um, and in the show, I think there might be something here in the exhibit that might be an example of it. And when we get to it, I think maybe... Um, Yes. Oh my gosh. That's it. That's it. I think Loveless Heart is going to be an incredible example of that when when we come to that segment. All right. So good. So the audience will have a perfect example of what we have here um, in in gallery to show exactly what has been by its combination between um, realism to what's I'm, maybe I'm mixing it up. Going from a Renaissance period to a, a modern cu cubism. Yes, you could call it cubism. Cubism, yes. So um, a blending or, or just coming together with a new a new period, and that's what he's created for himself in terms of his body of work. So that is wonderful, and we'll get to that during our next segment when we come together with that. Um, one of the things that we're also going to cover by when we look at the eight pieces that we've selected, um, we're going to ask you, as a creator of these pieces, when you created them, at what point did you stop and when did you start? Or were they pieces that you completed all together when, we came, when, you, when you were working on them? Okay. So what we'll do is that we will be going to break very, very shortly, and okay. we'll come back to you, bye. Okay. Thank you, thank you for being a part of our show. Again, you, um, this is Kane Roots Art Gallery. Please follow us on www.kanerootsartgallery.com. We're broadcasting on the Kalaloo Network Culture TV, Art Over Bush Tea. Thank you. I used to watch BET, MTV, VH1, now I watch Temper. Soca, Calypso, Reggae, Dance Hall. Don't star, better get tuned in to the Temper. Don't have cable, they got an app. Go to your app store, download that. Whether it's tourism, cuisine, or the social scenes, if it ain't Tempo, it's a wrap. Who got the Caribbean views? Tempo. It's the latest in Caribbean news. Tempo. You trying to cook Caribbean food? Tempo. You know they got the music videos, too. Tempo. Who got the Caribbean views? Tempo. It's the latest in Caribbean news. Tempo. You trying to cook Caribbean food? Tempo. You know they got the music videos, too. Tempo. Wow, uh, freedom right now means the ability to do what we actually set out to do uh, without, you know, any uh, prohibitions, without any, uh, you know, man-made hurdles. By the end of the Almighty, we found in this generation. And so uniting our region letting us see each other and understanding that together we are actually much stronger. Um, continuing to spread that unification. All these various islands we haven't been yet that just dying to, to feel the temple. You know, we're gonna go give it to them.
I, I always remember Frederick being, I mean, just from a very early age, um, very smart. Um, when he got older, he became very popular. You know, he was Mr. DJ, Mr. Entertainer, always dancing, always dancing. I'm sitting here at MTV Networks, and I real, I'm thinking to myself, well, Caribbean people have contributed so much to the world, and to, to world pop culture. I started to think about all of that, and I was like, wow, these are all the things that make great television. It's exciting, very exciting. You know, I um, always figure he'd do something like this. I never know to what extent he would be, but he always had the potential to do something like this. From that moment, I knew that Temple was going to be something special, something new, something different, because there was this confident, easygoing, you know, proud black brother. He got right into it, told me all about what he had in mind, all about what his visions and his dreams were. You know, I was hooked, line and sinker. For me, Tempo is really embodied the Caribbean, not just in music and just in videos, but as in life on different islands. He was the main person that, that, that pushed me and supported me. And if it weren't for that push, I probably wouldn't have hosted up until now. In the short time that I've been here, almost a year and a half that I've been here at Temple, I have really seen how hard you work and I can only imagine how much work you have put in over these past 15 years. Because I believe that I've been ordained to do what I'm doing and that is to put my fist up and say Caribbean is the most extraordinary place on earth. And we're back. I'm Sonia Nahardin at Cane Roots Art Gallery. Welcome. And we are with our guest artist today, fondly known as Bai, full name, Carl Carney Bain. Welcome back, Bai. Thank you. But Bai, you, you shared a little bit when we were talking before but um, if you can elaborate a little bit more on how you work. You, you touched upon it a little bit about working with a few pieces at a time. So um, just kind of expand on that process for us. So what happens with that process when you're working on multiple pieces at one time, what you're doing is you're creating an unconscious expression on that canvas. So at some point during the exploration or or the, uh, the applying of the paint or what have you, the canvas will tell you what to put. It will, it will give you an idea or it will show you uh, maybe somewhere in the composition you see a line going a certain way and that line attracts you or a color block. You see a certain color block and you say, oh, that reminds me of so-and-so. And therefore you develop or build on that, 
that line or that color block. So when you so this unconscious expression, when you're creating it, it your unconscious brings you into the conscious of that image. Right, that's the best way I can explain that. All right. So in the creative side of you, by um, the creative genius side of you, because everybody who creates, I think, I do believe, me personally, in the creative side, there is that genius. So in that process of creating, what do you do on the other side of you when you're not creating, when you're not doing your art? I've had to ask this. I've asked this of artists who are married and who have children and how they incorporate all those different things into their creative process. Um, but for you, I'm going to ask you, what do you do when you're not creating? I'm usually reading history. Um, usually the Civil War, I'm a Civil War buff, um, and as well as World War II. I like those parts of history uh, because of the uh, the, the destruction that both of those wars created, which weren't necessary, but also like studying human behavior. Uh, World War II was very interesting to me because of how Nazi German, Germany almost got away with it uh, with the creation of the V-2 rockets. Um, if they had were able to finish those rockets, we might be under a different regime. Um, so I think about history uh, a lot, and um, I read art articles as well. Um, and I try to keep up with like art uh, in America and just different art magazines with contemporary art. And I try to read about um, your artists that are really doing, uh, well, just different artists is basically the best way to describe that. And, um, I also like watching classical films, uh, in particular the Japanese uh, films, the samurai uh, era, uh, because of, I um, can't think of the uh, film producers, Kurosawa um, and his uh, samurai movies um, and how those movies historically influenced your American Westerns, uh, such as uh, the movie Magnificent Seven came from the Seven Samurai, uh, which was uh -huh. so, um, but also in the filmography of, of those movies, the Japanese movies, um, they just created a lot of new, not a lot of new things. I think someone might have thought of it, but the way they filmed or made, made their films uh, as well as building their characters in that film, I just think it's very unique and uh, it's really influenced, again, not a, not only Western, American Westerns, but other parts of American cin cinematography. So I watch those because they're in black and white. And um, for black and white, I'm sorry. I've known, you, I've known you for eight years and I never knew um, your interest in, in Civil War history and World War II history. So that's something new that I've learned about you. And we do share, um, I, and I don't think you've ever known that I've had an interest in, in samurai movies. Oh. I've, I've always liked the cinematography in samurai movies. Yes. So that's something that we share in common and we have never talked about that. Well, Super. What's your favorite movie? Um, you know, I've seen a few and I can't think of anyone in particular okay. um, that I can actually say um, say that the name comes to mind. But I was also, again, fascinated when you said that um, the, the Western movie was influenced, the, the Western movie was influenced by the, the, um, the samurai movie. Yeah. And I, again, we see a lot of that sometimes in, in art or we see it in movies or just in, um, in culture that in art in some place, we'll see art and culture someplace else and they would reproduce it or then sometimes even take it as their own 
but that that has happened so many times that I've seen that also in art and culture that that it's um I'm trying to think of the right word um, where it's just lifted um, and sometimes it's lifted and it's not given credit for it's not until someone makes a correlation to say oh you know this was this idea was taken or this format was taken from the samurai movie that was made before. And we might not just know that, or we might not have seen the samurai movie because some people will not necessarily watch something in a subtitle. And also too, for me, I love subtitle movies. I just watched a Taiwanese movie in subtitles on Netflix. And that's what I love also with Netflix and COVID. I get to see a lot of foreign movies and I love hearing foreign languages and watching and watching the subtitles. It's so it's it's so exciting. I get excited by um, hearing foreign languages also. So just a little tidbit that I can share to the li listening audience and with you in terms of our own relationship that we have as friends. Um, so I'm going to move from. Um, Moving on from asking you, and then re I'm really glad that I've had a chance to ask. Oh, but also, I also know that besides, I know something else that you like to do. Besides that, I know you like trying new types of foods. Yeah. Are you here? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Yeah. Um, in terms of... Um, developing a base for people to see your work, especially in times of COVID. How do you reach out to get people to see more of your work? Well, basically just by using Facebook. Um, I think I have to say that this COVID thing has actually been a blessing for me because for years I had a website and no one ever, people would go to the website and then I would come into New York with a show, doing a, an art show. And people would walk up to me and say, well, you know, I was at your website and I saw this piece. Did you bring this piece with you? And I'm like, why didn't you send me an email? Um, so I say that to say that using Facebook all these years, you know, it's, it's beginning to pay dividends, I think. Um, because the virus has forced people inside and people are still buying. Or, and so the other thing is, I think it's a mixture of things too. Um, people have seen my work and then they say, well, how can I reach out to you? And I give them the Facebook page. And then they'll go on Facebook and I might not hear from them for a year or two years. Then all of a sudden I get this message in Facebook. You know, do you still have this painting from three years ago? And I say no, uh, but you know what's available to you is what you see on Facebook. So um, that for the last year has been really, really uh, been good for me uh, because as I mentioned earlier in our conversation, it's just building those different people, this person or that person, that person knows this person. So it's like a little circle of friends and uh, so, I hope that answers your question. Answer my question because um, it's a wonderful connector, um, specifically now in terms of COVID and in terms of how the gallery is run and people not being able to come in to the gallery sometimes due to COVID, that they can actually go to the website, www.canerootsartgallery.com um, see the artists, see the featured artists, which is now you, and then go to the gallery store and then to see the works and then also decide if they want to come in and see it in person and decide if they want to buy it. So the, um, the format of pushing people through technology and being online or Facebook and Facebook and your tool is very powerful because whatever algorithm that they have for you buy on Facebook, I get your Facebook page every day. So whatever is happening with you, continue to do it because I get at least, I would say, two posts from you every day. And that's incredible. 
and, and, the, and the works are there, they're up and people respond. And you, I think you can see that for yourself. Yes. That your work, that it, it is your, for me. I can say for me. I I can I don't know what other people say to you, but I see your work every day on Facebook. So yeah. I thank you for that. Thank you. All right, <laughs> we're going to we're going to take a break and we'll be back. Association, and tonight we are celebrating the greatest art form on the planet, Black American music. There are over 50 genres, including new jack swing and disco and funk, that are part of the Black American music art form, and we're here tonight to celebrate some of our greats and our legends and pay homage to those that are the very bedrock of culture. So tonight at the Black American Music uh, event that we're doing in conjunction with the Georgia Entertainment Caucus, we are launching and announcing the nominees for the Black Music and Entertainment Walk of Fame. And in June, June 12th, we'll be actually inducting and putting the emblem into the ground here in Atlanta, Georgia. We chose Atlanta, Georgia because it is the mecca of all Black entertainment. So we're happy to work in conjunction with the state as well as the city and uh, Mayor Lance Bottoms to make sure that this much needed monument is erected. Hey there, my name is Michael Malden and I'm the chairman of the Black American Music Association. I'm a partner with the Black Music and Entertainment Walk of Fame, the executive that is. And uh, you know, reaching out, letting all my brothers and sisters down the Caribbean know what we're doing here in the city of Atlanta. We're here tonight where we have basically introduced to the world the Black Music and Entertainment Walk of Fame, and that is where we will be laying down, similar to like the Hollywood Walk of Fame, except we're doing ours with a crown, where we will honor kings and queens uh, of black music and entertainment, and really give our legacy a chance to be seen and be heard, as well as educate our next generation. And when you come to Atlanta, because I know you're coming, please come and check us out. Um, again, it's not an Atlanta or a Georgia thing, it just happens to be here in Atlanta, Georgia, but it's international. So we need to, to come and be a part of this day. Do I look like I want a damn croissant? 
I'm sorry. <laughs> my name is Sandra. Come on, Bally. You're going to make people think you're dead already. Welcome back to Cane Rose Art Gallery and Callaloo Network Culture TV, broadcasting on Temple Network. We're presenting Art Over Bush Tea, and we are honored to have our featured guest artist, Carl Carney Bain, again, warmly known to us as Bi. And I have to tell you, I didn't, uh, I didn't mention it to anyone, but if you've noticed uh, a correlation to what's been featured every time um, we introduce a new segment, there's some of Bai's artwork up. But I'm also wearing a Bai collection. Bai is also known for placing his artwork on shirts, t-shirts. I have a beautiful handbag that has an abstract painting on it. And besides this beautiful, again, shirt, I can't get up because we won't be able to move the camera around to see it happen, but it's actually a portrait. This shirt features a full portrait of, of a face. And um, I've owned it for about four years. And I also, I just wear it very, very proudly. So bye, I just wanna say thank you for my wearable art. And it, and it, it also um, provokes conversation when I wear it. And even when I carry my bag, it provokes conversation. I think anything about your creations that I carry on my person provokes conversation. So I just wanna say thank you for that. Thank you for purchasing them so, and supporting me. I've been, I've been a patron for, uh, for eight years and it's, it's, been, it's, been, it's been really nice. It's, it's yeah. nice to wake up, it's nice to move around my home and see works that that have been created by you. We're going to begin this segment by looking at eight pieces in the gallery that I've chosen to um, have by look at them with me. So um, let's start with that. In the first segment, um, the first. One, we're going to be looking at Woody and Man with Curly Hair. Bye, can you see those two? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, Feel free to, to share and jump in and talk about those two pieces. Uh, Woody is the, was a piece created um, let me give you the historical background. Um, I've always liked black films, and even though they've never gotten the exposure until now, thanks to uh, the internet, but one of my favorite actors during the 1960s and the 1950s, or from the 1950s, was a guy named Woody Strode, and he 
former football player at UCLA. I'm sorry? Repeat the name again, Woody. Woody Strode, S-T-R-O-D-E. Okay, Woody Strode, thank you. He was a former football player at UCLA um, during the 1940s. And I think he and Jackie Robinson were at UCLA at the same time. But he's like 6'4", chiseled body. Uh, he just had this look. And I always thought that as an actor when I was a kid and I saw one of his Western, uh, it was, I think the first movie I saw him in was Sergeant Rutledge. And I just thought he had a, a, a presence on the stage or on the movie or on the set. He had a presence, a visual presence. And I thought this guy should be a superstar or a, mo a big time movie star. And he just never got those, um, he never got that exposure. And the movie, another movie that he was in, he was in several, but they were always like uh, very uh, condescending towards his character. But the one movie that I liked, unfortunately he got killed in it, <laughs> was uh, uh, Once Upon a Time in the West. Uh, he, <coughs> It was in the very beginning of the movie, and uh, he just had this black hat, and he just had that masculine look, and uh, so that's what the piece is named after. So he was, I always loved him as an actor. I, it's just one of those people I wish, uh, if we're in today's society, he would be a, a superstar, um, and uh, so I kind of like always use his portrait for men, masculinity. Uh, I always think of him for some reason. And uh, <laughs> look, Woody Strode up. Continue. Go ahead. And a man with curly hair. Uh, I was basically trying to create an Aborigine, uh, a native of Australia, uh, and this is what came up to me um, because his hair is so curly and so wild. I, I wanted to capture the primitive, um, I know I'm going to get slammed for this, but the primitive beauty uh, of the Aborigines. And so that's where that piece came from. Okay, but that's your expression. Did you just said yeah. you, you were saying you might get slammed for this? Yeah. Uh, using the word primitive can be, if you're not using it correctly or is how some people might respond to the word primitive. Mm -hmm. so, um, but that's what I wanted to capture in that portrait. And I think I did I a great that. job. Yeah, no, you, you did well. You did well. Well, you know, I'm one who loves your portraits. So um, it's captured very well. I love the, um, I love the pulling out towards over one of the eyes in the red. Mm -hmm. and then um, you sort of off balance the red down to the, um, the neck, to the shoulder yeah. coming yeah. down. Um, that appeals to my eye. That appeals to my eye in terms of, of the balance. And then you have the, the shadow over the top of the eye in the same color as the bottom of the other eye. They're just specific things that I like in terms of its structure. Um, it might, might not necessarily be your intent, but there's also pieces of the work that I love in terms of the structure of it. So here we go next to another one of my favorites. And this gets into talking about the cubism. So I'm going to let you roll with that one because she's really lovely to look at, lover's heart. So I'm gonna let you, the creative, talk about this one. Okay, um, if you notice the red that's on the body cavity, that's her heart. So that's why I titled the piece, Lover's Heart. Um, I wanted to capture like the Gogon, the um, the island women. I have I've always had an attraction to women that are on an island, um, and I guess that comes through television. And so the mixing the the culture of 
African culture, if you look at the eyes, uh, they're definitely from African sculpture. And then you look at the bodies done in the cubist form. And the colors, of course, um, it represents a universal woman, uh, women in general, just, and just a woman's lover's heart. I just put that red, and that's what gave me the title. I shared with someone last week or the week before that Picasso's work, Cubism, that whole genre of artists along with Picasso, and there are many others besides Picasso, but we tend to hear Picasso's name a lot, but there are many others along with him that were, were famous, but probably didn't necessarily, um, I'll use the term blow up like Picasso but fell under cubism. And I was explaining to this friend of mine, cubism is taken from the basis of African design and African sculpture. Yes. And they said, really? I said, yeah. So yes. right away, the person, the wonderful thing about the internet, took out his phone and he looked it up. And he said, oh, wow. I never knew that about Picasso and this whole group of artists that created during, during the time. So he was surprised and he didn't know where it also came from. So it's very important then when we can tell those stories that we can have a perspective on where some of the beginnings of it come from. So which, which you do very well, which is something that I've always loved about your work also. So, um, that's um, that piece. And you can also see when you look at books like um, African art, you can, you can also see where when you're talking about um, cubism, I'm going to try to find a piece that would um, would sort of depict this. Um, by if I, if I went to some masks, would this be relative? I don't know if you can see what I'm seeing. Uh, yes and no. I, most of the African, most of your Western artists who use African masks is usually the Balu, the Babalu, um, I'm pronouncing it wrong. It's the slender African mass is the foundation that I've noticed and that artists use, and I use it as well. Um, Looking for the slender ones. Yes, the slender face one. Okay, the slender faces. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. I'll, I'll have more time to go through this book and um, see exactly what it is that um, I should be looking for when I look to it for cubism. So that's good. So if we look across from Lover's Heart, there is Island Man with white head scarf. Right. This piece I was thinking of a fisherman, because um, I also love the scene of, of island people out in their boats going fishing. And for some reason, this this face or this composition came to me, and what I had envisioned one of the fishermen might look like. So that's that. Then we move on to Libby. You know, I really. I always do women portraits. Let me rephrase that statement. Most of my portraits, if not all of them, are women. And that's just based upon where it comes from. When I was in college, all of your models were basically women. And um, so I, I just enjoy doing portraits of women. Libya, just one of those images that came to me. Mm -hmm. Are the majority, um, well, you said you do a lot of women, so you were saying that the majority of your 
portraits are of women. Yes. Yes. Okay. I'll come I to just recently, I just okay. recently started doing men about maybe four years ago on a regular basis. Okay. Because so, for the last two years, a lot of my portraits have also been men. Uh, the last frontier that I need to conquer or do uh, is children. Um, so. And then next to that is a piece called Confrontation. Okay, the foundation for that piece, I can't really take credit for it. Um, there's an artist in the 1960s named Merton Simpson. And he did this piece in black ink wash on white paper with different uh, values of uh, gray and black, or hues of gray and black, excuse me. And it's one of the most powerful pieces I've ever seen done on uh, about confrontations. Uh, it was during the 1964 riots in Watts, or the riots in the U.S. in general. And we fast forward to today, and we see the same thing happening, uh, riots and confrontations. And so I've always loved that piece by Bergen. Um, and I just wanted to create my um, confrontation. Uh, and now that things keep escalating, I might do another one. It's so funny that you said that because the question, one of the questions that I had for you was, has there been a time where the political time influenced your work? Um, I usually try to stay away from that. Um, but unfortunately, well, as of lately, maybe it's an age thing because I get tired of seeing the same thing happen over and over and over again. Um, the thing with George Floyd, um, that really bothered me was that no one really, if that was the 1960s, I think that there would have been a different situation or outcome. I think that police officer doing that act right then and there would not have gotten away with it. So um, my question when that happened was, why does it keep happening? And then you can go back to other uh, situations, uh, Tamir Rice, and no um, Trayvon Martin. And to me, no one has really addressed a certain issue that's been kind of like swept under the rug, not really looked at. And that is, why does it keep happening? And so my political view, I keep to myself. Um, and so I, I won't share why it keeps happening, at least not right now. Well, even though you stay away from it, this um, this piece is powerful. I know you've given credit to someone else as an inspiration for it, but it's 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 very powerful and it's quite applicable to today. And who knows what else can come about from it in terms of um, dealing with our political time, our political clash of culture time, clash of um, still knowing that we're living in an, in, we're living in a society where things are still in reminiscent of things in the past, and we haven't really moved forward. We've we've elected Barack Obama, but how far have we really come? You know, we've had the civil rights era but still how far have we come? So confrontation still addresses for me, if that's the only one that I get to see in this lifetime of your work, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a political statement for me. And we move to our last two pieces, which are um, woman with curly hair and Sonny, and actually Sonny, this image of Sonny we use for our invitation to the opening for the art gallery. So tell us a little bit about that before we, we end our show today. Okay, um, Sonny is just basically another island woman uh, with flowers. Um, 
a very pretty woman with pretty flowers. It's kind of the way I, I like that I thought of that series when I was doing that series. Um, women with curly hair is kind of like goes back to um, a man with curly hair. Uh, with the exception that 70% of women in America have curly hair. And I never knew that. Um, and so then this is the uh, Aborigine thing of, uh, of the curly hair, the wild curly hair. So it really, and I was working on a technique with uh, oil pastel, that something that came to me one night. And I wanted to uh, explore it some more. And so this piece and man with curly hair came out of that series of using oil pastel, uh, which is something I haven't done since the 1970s. Well, I, I'm glad we ended on woman with curly hair in terms of um, women defining their own hair these days of wearing it how they would like to wear it. I'm certainly a product of that. I'm wearing my, my hair exactly how I want it. Haven't gotten to the hairdresser in a while in terms of getting a haircut, but through COVID being able to wear my hair natural and wearing it out curly and being very satisfied and feeling quite beautiful each and every day. Bye, I cannot thank you enough um, for being a part of our Art Over Bush Tea and being our current guest artist at Portraits and Abstract. Is there anything else you would um, like to, to share with us? Give us some, um, some uh, a closing sentence or, or just summing up something about who you are. Well, for you to leave. I'm not very good at doing those kind of things. I just wanted to thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm not a person with a lot of words. I'm very straightforward and kind of dull. So, but thank you so much. Um, and, uh, thank you for being my friend. Okay. Well, let me let me sum up some words here for the listening audience. Um, I will reiterate that I've known by for eight years, and yes, he's always been extremely straightforward extremely talented. Anyone who gets to know him will appreciate his work and the beauty of it and will just walk away and just, just continue to take it in. I think whenever you see his work, you do not forget it because there's something about the eyes in his work the eyes that look back at you. The eye, they say the eyes are the mirror of your soul. So his work is always a way of looking back inside of you. So he won't say that, but I'm saying this is how I interpret it. And that is what I feel about his work. So a big thank you. I'm grateful. And for everyone listening, please follow us on www.kingrootsartgallery.com. We will be coming to you every two weeks from the gallery over bush tea and um, celebrating the fact that we drink bush tea here in St. Croix. Matter of fact, today's bush tea came straight from the market. All of the ingredients that I shared with you today came straight from the market. My sister picked it up, she brewed it for me and it made it a very enjoyable time. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening or day. I'm sorry. <laughs>